Britain was at its lowest ebb when the fighting in North Africa began in earnest in 1940. There were barely 50,000 British troops to guard Egypt and the other African colonies. Denuded of armor after Dunkirk, Britain could not give them the support they urgently needed to combat any future German aggression. The aggression came swiftly, but not from the Germans. In a theater of war that was to see great commanders and armies gain legendary status, this was the Battle of the Desert Rats, Montgomery, the Africa Corps and Rommel. It was the weak puppet Mussolini who, having failed to penetrate a mortally wounded France, turned his sights on an empire in Africa. An easy victory seemed assured. There were over half a million Italians and colonial Italian troops on the continent. Hitler was content. Without bases in Africa, Britain would be unable to open up the second front in Italy. As so often during this most ugly of human conflicts, Britain drove a skewer into the grandest plans of the fascists. Under the scalding African sun, Britain and the Commonwealth troops from India, New Zealand, South Africa and Australia began the bitter struggle to tear apart the Third Reich. Finally, Wavell decided that attack was the best form of defense and prepared his troops to move on the Italians. On the night of December the 7th, 1940, 30,000 troops began the 75-mile advance through the desert towards Sidi Barani. The extraordinary war in the African desert had begun. Wavell had intended the assault to be no more than a large-scale raid lasting five days. To his amazement, the attack was transformed into an offensive that ended with the collapse of the Italian army. What happened once the Allies had penetrated the gap in the Italians' chain of fortresses was repeated over and over for the next two months as the Italians retreated further westward. As the Commonwealth Matilda tanks and infantry dissected the defenses, the toll of prisoners began to mount rapidly into the tens of thousands. The fighting was fierce in a struggle that was to last into 1943. Sidi Barani was overrun by the evening of the 10th. The Italians were routed at every town along the coast, from Tobruk to Benghazi and Beda Fom as the Allies pressed on relentlessly through Cyrenaica. In one remarkable advance, the 4th Armoured Brigade drove 170 miles in 33 hours before joining battle to destroy enemy artillery and transport columns. The brilliance of their achievement at Beda Fom, where the fighting had culminated in 3,000 Allied troops capturing 20,000 enemy troops, seemed to symbolize the entire enterprise. Bombers, the Navy, the Anzac troops, the tanks, artillery and infantry all had worked seamlessly together. Churchill believed that the pinnacle had been reached. The apparent ease of victory made him anxious to pursue one of his personal war aims and the result was a prelude to Hitler's pursuance of his personal dream in Russia. Both ended in disaster. Churchill longed to join forces with Greece and the Balkan states to create a stronghold against Hitler. The Greeks had dealt the Italians another blow when they had invaded Greece, and their dogged resistance inspired Churchill to carry out his plan. Accordingly, he wished to siphon off as many forces from Africa as possible and send them to Greece. To the frustration of his commanders in the field, here is Lieutenant General Richard O'Connor, commander of the Western Desert Force. He halted the Allied advance in Africa just as it was poised for complete success. Over 130,000 prisoners and some 400 tanks destroyed had given the wrong signal. An initial 50,000 men arrived in Greece at the beginning of March. The redeployment almost proved a double fatality. For Hitler, 
alarmed at the prospect of British occupation of the whole North African coastal area, summoned a young officer to see him on February the 6th. The meeting catapulted the general into the history books as one of Germany's legendary war commanders. He was Erwin Rommel, whose skilled and humane leadership was to earn him admiration and the respectful nickname of the Desert Fox. Rommel was given command of a small armoured force that was to go to the aid of the Italians before it was too late. In anyone else's hands, it may well have already been too late. Rommel was in Tripoli on the 12th of February. Only on the 11th of March did the 1st Tank Regiment arrive. With their advent, the consequences of Churchill's attention on Greece manifested themselves. Rommel ignored orders and began his advance. He was woefully undermanned with just 80 tanks and the unwilling Italians behind. With lorries creating dust clouds and hastily built dummy tanks disguising his lack of armour, Rommel's advance had an astounding effect. The British began to fall back in panic. Commanders and troops were taken prisoner a whole armoured brigade wiped out. It was a collapse as great, if not greater, than that of the Italians. By April the 11th, the British had been ignominiously swept back into Egypt. Cyrenaica was in German hands. The calamity was absolute, for on the 6th, German troops had landed in Greece. 12,000 Allied soldiers were captured and more valuable armour lost. Churchill's dream had turned into a debacle before it vanished into smoke and blood, leaving Africa balanced on a knife edge. The terrors of war were punctuated by acts of kindness, as Germans pointed out to British stretcher bearers the whereabouts of their wounded comrades. Suffering men from both sides were lulled to sleep by Lala Anderson as she breathed Lily Marlene over the radio waves, the song all desert soldiers came to think of as their own. On the 30th, Rommel launched an all-out assault on the besieged town. The Australians fought to their last breath as panzers burst through the defences. British artillery and counter-attacks met them and the fighting raged on, confused and merciless, over the next three days. The fighting cost Rommel over 1,000 men, but he was still unable to occupy more than a few sections of the perimeter defences. From Berlin came the order that he was not to attack again or to move further into Egypt. Rommel was furious. A stalemate set in during which time the British made the first attempt at rectifying the dangerous situation they were suddenly confronted with. Rommel was aware that Cairo was within his grasp, the reason his frustration was so great. His ability to deal with two British attacks that followed in May and June showed what he was capable of once set free of constraints. In May, the British Operation Brevity was defeated after initial successes. Intended to prepare a springboard for a larger assault across the Egyptian border into Cyrenaica, it left over 200 Allied casualties with a loss of over 20 tanks. Despite this, Operation Battleaxe was given the green light on the 15th of June at 2.30 a.m. It too failed a foretaste of the death and terror still to come. British tanks were confronted at short range by the lethal 88mm guns and heavy artillery in gruelling combat that spread over three days. It lost the Allies' 30 aircraft and 1,000 men. For Wavell, it was the end of his command. Churchill informed him that he was to be replaced with 57-year-old General Sir Claude Orkinlek. But as a period of reorganisation for both armies set in, 
the problems for the British had only just broken the surface. Yet on the German side, all was not in the optimal state Rommel would have wished. His Panzer Group Africa, which included the Africa Corps, received the last reinforcements in June, bringing his forces up to 119,000 troops, 400 partly Italian tanks, some still in repair, and less than 550 planes. To add to his worries, Hitler had begun his campaign in Russia. If Rommel wished to go ahead with his plan in Egypt, he would have to rely on what he already had. No help from the Führer could now be expected. Auchinleck had chosen 54-year-old General Sir Alan Gordon Cunningham to oppose the Desert Fox, and Churchill, rectifying his earlier mistake, tripled the size of the Allied Desert Forces so that they now totaled 118,000 men and 700 tanks, whilst the Desert Air Force had the use of almost 650 planes. An impressive array that was to take part in Operation Crusader, designed to relieve Tobruk and make short work of Rommel's presence in Africa. So Rommel was caught off guard when, on the 18th, the Allied offensive waves rolled out into the desert over the Egyptian border. Unconvinced that a major operation was underway, he only ordered a few panzers to foray out. Cunningham lost 50 tanks when they clashed with the panzers, but as there was no sign of a large-scale confrontation, he returned to his base at Madalena, satisfied with progress. And then the storm broke. Rommel had realized his mistake, and on the 22nd launched an assault at the British. The results were dramatic. Over 100 tanks were destroyed, 300 men lost their lives. But if the British wanted to know what Rommel was really capable of, the proof came the next day. A full-scale onslaught crashed over the British positions one after the other, leaving behind a sea of wreckage and flames. The South Africans alone lost 3,400 out of 5,700 men. It was the blackest day the Allies had yet endured. There were to be many more. Cunningham wavered. Orkinleck remained calm. He was soon to discover that Rommel was, after all, not infallible. On the 24th, the German commander, having boldly crossed the border into Egypt, attempted to cut off from the rear those Allied troops that had pressed on towards Tobruk. Panic developed into utter confusion as the two sides unwittingly mingled with one another's troops. Even Rommel spent most of the night on the 24th surrounded by the British. Enthused by his earlier successes, he had overestimated himself. Fifteen miles into Egypt, he was left without supplies and forced to retreat, too late to prevent Tobruk from being relieved by the New Zealanders. Churchill was, of course, delighted. So delighted that in December, he promptly repeated his decision which had led to Rommel's original success. He diverted forces that had been destined for Africa to British territories in the Far East, where Japan had begun to cause trouble. The situation in Africa deteriorated anew as U-boat and Luftwaffe raids in the Mediterranean increased. The Allies, now being starved of replacements and reinforcements, were opposed by a German panzer force that was being replenished with armor and fuel. Rommel burst back into action on May the 26th, and as the Italians hit the British head-on, Rommel led 10,000 vehicles around the defensive lines to attack from the rear. What he hadn't calculated on meeting were the US tanks that had been delivered to the British. Rommel was stopped in his tracks, forced to withdraw into a semicircle surrounded by British fortified areas, nicknamed boxes. Ritchie, on the brink of dealing a death blow to the Germans, was urged on. Ritchie dithered for two days, 
two days too long for a man of Rommel's caliber. On June the 1st, Germans smashed into the defensive line known as the Gazala line, breaching it fatally. A vicious fight broke out over the Bir Hakeim box, guarded by the French. For eight days, the Luftwaffe and the German artillery hurled all they had at the box, but the French refused to surrender until Ritchie finally ordered them to do so. Overnight, they evacuated the fort, leaving Rommel nothing but a few injured men and weapons to capture. An inspiring display of what could have been achieved in France one year earlier. Rommel, driving northwards, took out all the fortifications he encountered. His success soon gave him a two-to-one advantage in tank armor. His advance was becoming unstoppable. Now there was just one last hurdle before he renewed his focus on Egypt. Tobruk. Tobruk was filled with new recruits, but left without any determined plan by Ritchie. As the Germans attacked, the Commonwealth troops outside of the town were withdrawn, leaving the way open for the panzers. Luftwaffe bombers were in the air again, flying 580 sorties in one day, whilst the Italian and German artillery hammered the fortress without pause. The bombardment was followed by Italian and German infantry racing onto the defenders, and the fighting began to reach a bloody but mercifully swift climax. One day after the attack had begun, it was all over. Tobruk had fallen together with tanks, equipment and supplies. Rommel's reward was equally as swift. Hitler made him a field marshal. Churchill was devastated. A catastrophe of unimaginable proportions lurched up over the entire British war effort. Who could stop Rommel from sweeping into Egypt? No one, it seemed. And whilst he thrust forward towards the River Nile, that he predicted his soldiers would see within ten days, Cairo and Alexandria were caught in the fever of evacuation. Orkinlek was dumbfounded by the setbacks, relieved Ritchie of his command and took over the leadership of the 8th Army himself. He withdrew his troops along the coast to a small fortified settlement bounded by the Mediterranean to the south and the 700-foot-deep Cuttera Depression to the north. Unexpectedly, its name would be mentioned with pride whenever the Desert War was recalled in future years. The place was known as El Alamein. Only history would show that another giant of the desert had arrived on the scene to take over command of the 8th Army and play the desert fox at his own game. He did not need to be told to go down to the desert and defeat Rommel. The new man in charge intended to do just that. For he was Lieutenant General Bernard Law Montgomery, affectionately known to his men as Monty. The legend of El Alamein was about to take shape. Montgomery's arrival at El Alamein on August the 13th, 1942, had an electric effect on the troops and the preparations for the expected all-out German attack. Under Montgomery, there was no more talk of a retreat, but of fighting and dying where defenders stood. Not one yard was to be given up. The British were also heartened by the tanks, troops and men now beginning to arrive in large numbers. Rommel knew he would have to strike quickly, and Monty was soon in his first confrontation with the Desert Fox. The Germans began to move on August the 30th. Mines prevented the panzers from moving as swiftly as Rommel had hoped, and after a night of mine clearing, the main attack could only get underway at 10 a.m. under heavy Allied bombing. With surprise gone, he altered his plan of attack only to discover that Monty had anticipated him. Rommel's Africa Corps switched the attack to the Alam el Halfa Ridge 
to be met by vicious defending in which bombers and dug-in tanks caused havoc in the German lines. The battle lasted until September the 3rd, when Rommel was forced to retreat through lack of fuel. On the night of October the 23rd, 1942, the Germans heard the faint throbbing of British bombers. At 9.40, the air was split with the thunder of 1,000 artillery pieces firing at the German lines. At 10 o'clock, the sappers moved forward in advance of the infantry and tanks to clear the mines. It proved more difficult than anticipated, and the advance was held up. Elsewhere, the troops had run into similar problems, as the tanks were stalled in half-cleared mine lanes, clogged with infantry and subjected to heavy German fire. the Commonwealth death rate rose alarmingly, with the Luftwaffe adding to the terror. Montgomery quickly faced up to the truth. He was not going to be successful with his plan. The advance was halted. Undaunted, he set about swiftly redesigning the offensive. He was wise to do so, for Rommel had arrived back at El Alamein on the 25th. This was no time for stubbornness. Rommel was still ill when he took command again. Hitler's private fantasy world had already taken over the Führer's thinking, and while he promised endless reserves of troops and equipment that could never materialize, Rommel knew the reality was grim. He was in a war of attrition, which, if carried to the bitter end, would wipe out the Germans completely. With his faith in the Führer gone, he tried to rally his badly mauled troops and hold the line, but his counterattacks misfired. The sands were shifting. The breakthrough was not long in coming. The Australians had made significant progress in the northern sector, and Rommel had to make a one-off decision. It was to send his 21st panzers to strengthen the weakening line opposite the Australians. Without fuel for redeployment, it was all or nothing, but the odds were against him. Montgomery ordered Operation Supercharge to be launched. It burst over the Germans at 1 a.m. on the night of October the 28th. The artillery barrage crept forwards like a curtain of flame and began the most terrifying engagement that the Desert War had to offer its suffering warriors. Rommel's anti-tank screen poured fire onto the advancing troops. Tanks were blown into flames, cremating the men inside. Nonetheless, those that survived pressed on and rolled over the German defenders in the gun pits. Machine guns decimated the Germans where they stood. As the fierce sun seared the men locked in battle amidst the blood and sand, the death toll on both sides became horrendous. Montgomery was forced to rethink once again. Regrouping his troops, he launched a new attack on November the 2nd. The results were shattering. Minefields brought more delays, and at daylight the main armoured thrust was left facing Rommel's anti-tank guns. The bitter fighting only stopped when light faded, and the tally was extremely worrying. 200 more British tanks put out of action and very little ground gained. Rommel had thrown all his might into the counter-attacks on the Allied flanks. But as the day ended, he was confronted with the inescapable fact that, despite his success, he could not force an ultimate victory. His resources were simply too few. He ordered a withdrawal. Hitler put a stop to his plan. In a ghastly parallel to what was happening in Stalingrad, Hitler ordered Rommel to stand fast. Reluctantly, Rommel obeyed the man who had refused to give him the modest support he needed and halted the retreat. He was powerless to prevent the 4th of November continue the relentless slaughter of his men and armor and the disintegration of his hopes once so close to realization. For Rommel, it had been too much to bear. By the end of the day, he could no longer condone the madness. Contradicting the Führer order, 
he began to pull his forces away from the front lines. He had lost 32,000 men. As decisive in defeat as in battle, he moved his men at breakneck speed to escape any British attempt to cut him off. Suddenly, an eerie quiet flooded the battlefield. Wrecks and shattered bodies were strewn over the sand as far as the eye could see. Smoke wreathed into the blue sky as the Allies counted the cost of this major victory. Thirteen and a half thousand casualties in the twelve days of the attack. It had been a high price to pay, and many officers were angered. Montgomery, however, had fulfilled his task. For Rommel and the Africa Corps, there now began a long retreat across 1,400 miles of Libyan desert that was to be every bit as dangerous as the battles they had fought. But the reality of what had happened at Alamein was undeniable. The end of the German presence in Africa was now just a matter of time. The British failed time and again to exploit their advantages and finish the job, even though they were at times ahead of the retreating German forces. Rommel was the consummate commander and able to block their flanking maneuvers long enough for his columns to pass them and continue the withdrawal. The British always stopped for the night so that Rommel, even in defeat, could keep one step ahead. By November the 7th, Rommel had reached Sidi Barani, and despite heavy British bombing, the troops suffered relatively little damage. With good discipline, a 25-mile long traffic jam on the coast road was soon moving again. The British still proved themselves unable to catch the columns streaming westwards. Minefields, lack of fuel, even the heavy rain that was later blamed for the weak attempts to stop Rommel undoubtedly played their part. Churchill had finally persuaded the Americans to agree to abandon an inadequately manned landing in Europe in favor of an African invasion. To keep the Americans happy, he had willingly agreed to Dwight D. Eisenhower being appointed as Commander-in-Chief of Allied North African forces. On November the 8th, the final chapter in the Desert War opened. It was to be as blood-stained as any that had preceded it. Just before one o'clock in the morning, some 107,000 American and British troops waded into the seas along 850 miles of North African coast from Casablanca to Algiers. Operation Torch was underway, the first combined Anglo-American operation of the war. In a grim twist of fate, Operation Torch found French soldiers firing on the very troops who wanted to help liberate their country. The regime in Vichy had promised Hitler to defend North Africa against Allied attack. Sadly, this is exactly what happened. General de Gaulle, in exile in England, had not been included in the planning for fear that his arrogance and opposition to the Patin puppet government in Vichy would turn even willing French officers against the Allied invasion force. His exclusion did nothing to help. As the assault craft neared the sands, French artillery opened up on the men, causing the first American casualties of the campaign. At all landing points, the story was the same. Withering French machine gun fire and artillery smashed into the troops bobbing towards land. Some of the landing craft stopped too far out, and men and equipment fell into eight feet of water before struggling to the beaches. Scenes of heart-rending contradiction took place in the dark waters off the coast. Whilst French guns fired, French soldiers in boats dragged injured Allied soldiers out of the waters to rescue them. Algiers proved to be the easiest objective. Many French surrendered without a shot fired, and by 7 p.m. that same evening, the town was under Allied control. Oran was harder to placate. Artillery pounded the ships into infernos, causing terrible deaths among the men on board. <laughs> 
Only 48 hours later could the town be wrested from French hands. At Casablanca, the powerful French naval vessel stationed there had put to sea to try and stop the landings. A fierce running battle took place that cost the lives of 500 French sailors. Their sacrifice was in vain, for the French fleet was finally wiped out. General Patton, striding the beaches on the 9th of November, found frightened young American soldiers desperately trying to escape French Air Force fire and was compelled to use every means at his disposal, including physical force, to get them to brave the firing and move equipment to safety. Casablanca was now the only objective still under French resistance. Patton decided on a full-scale air and naval assault. On the 11th, the bombers rose into the air as destroyers maneuvered into position to fire from off the coast. At 6.48 a.m., Patton put a call through to his signals officer. Admiral Darlin, head of the French North African authorities, had ordered a French ceasefire. At the last minute, the assault was cancelled. Now, with 200,000 French troops to help, the Allies intended to push for Tunis and occupy the whole of North Africa. Ironically, Hitler had belatedly realized that he had made a phenomenal blunder in ignoring Rommel's requests for reinforcements. Rommel was in danger of complete entrapment, and the Allies would have a perfect springboard to launch attacks on European soil. From the 9th of November until the end of the month, Stuckers, Messerschmitts, equipment and troops began pouring into Tunis. Eventually, some 250,000 Axis troops were standing ready to combat the Allied assaults. Rommel was understandably disgusted when he heard of the new troop formations that should have been his. The Allied advance ran into difficulties. In the first American-German fighting of the war, the Panzer IVs proved almost indestructible for the American tanks, and Luftwaffe superiority was alarming. Without speedy Allied reinforcement, the Germans were going to be able to establish an unassailable stronghold in North Africa. Meanwhile, Montgomery's forces had been reduced to the position of pursuers rather than attackers. They trundled along the coast behind the Germans, and Rommel was allowed a breathing space of two weeks once he had reached Mersa Brega. Laboriously, Montgomery brought up troops to attack the Germans and deliver the knockout punch with an elaborate plan. It was to begin on the night of the 11th to the 12th of December with large-scale diversionary raids. Unfortunately, Rommel slipped away into the night with his troops and the British were left with egg on their faces. The Germans were soon 250 miles away, near Barat. As the year drew to a close, Rommel and his men were still there. Further west, the Allies had also been forced to pause due to the adverse weather. But on the 23rd of December, the Allies began to advance on the hills around Tunis in an attempt to wrench vital positions on what was known as Long Stop Hill from the Germans. The hand-to-hand -hand fighting was pitiless. A British assault took the ridge from the Germans, but as the Americans took over, they were beaten back, and any further attempts to regain the heights under mortar and artillery bombardment proved futile. With hundreds of dead and injured comrades around them, the soldiers gladly followed the order to withdraw on Christmas Day. In the new year of 1943, Montgomery was again in action. From the 15th of January, Rommel was forced repeatedly to withdraw Axis troops from the overwhelming Allied advances. Montgomery was not pleased with the lacklustre performance of his armour and increasing supply problems. But he need not have worried. Rommel was aware that his main task now was to get as many troops as possible to Tunis. On January the 23rd, the 1,400-mile desert advance was crowned with the fall of Tripoli as British tanks entered the town unopposed.
an objective set in 1941 had finally been achieved. Mussolini was outraged. With the German forces combined under their commander, Colonel General Jürgen von Arnim, now joined by Rommel, Montgomery edging ever closer to Tunis and Eisenhower's forces preparing to pounce, the war in the desert was about to explode into its bitter finale. Rommel was still a sick man and had been informed that, for that reason, he was to be relieved of his command. Before he left, he showed the Allies what modern warfare was all about. With Axis troops and equipment steadily rising in numbers, whilst the Allies hesitated, the Desert Fox pounced. On February the 14th, his forces raced forward on the American bases near Sidi Bouzid. As the Stukas screamed in over the panzers, the surprised Americans rushed to open fire with their artillery. It was a hopeless enterprise. The tide of panzers was relentless, trapping the American infantrymen soon abandoned by the artillery gunners who fled under the onslaught. Allied counterattacks failed miserably. It was the beginning of an American flight through the Tunisian desert where they mingled with French and British forces to create confusion under a command system that had broken down. Were it not for the friction between the German commanders that prevented Rommel from executing his devastating swift tactical thrusts, there may have been an extension to the desert war that would have shaken the Allies to their foundations and taken untold lives. When General Sir Harold Alexander arrived to take over command of the Allied ground forces North Africa, Rommel was advancing again, although not where he wanted to, and still handicapped by Arnim's repositioning of the 10th Panzer Division. His goal was the Kasserine Pass, and from there Algeria, severing Allied supply lines. On the 9th of February, the Panzers appeared. Initially, the American artillery in the area was able to stall the attack, but the Germans sent in storm troops to round up pockets of defenders, and only hastily brought in reinforcements were able to keep the Germans bottled up in the pass. But the next day, Rommel ordered a full-scale assault. After a massive artillery barrage, large swathes of Axis troops advanced towards the defending Allies. They could not stop the overwhelming numbers of Africa Corps soldiers from bursting through the pass and flooding out into the basin beyond. For Rommel, it was the last large-scale victory in Africa. As the battles flowed over the next two days, and he was confronted with increased Allied strength, he began to lose the confidence that had characterized his unique leadership. Badly ill, and with Montgomery at his heels, his troops quietly slipped away from the hard-won Kasserine Pass and went to confront their old adversary. The Allies didn't even know he had gone. The two great commanders met for the last time near the town of Medinin. When Rommel attacked on the 6th of March, the British had known for two days that he was coming. Surprise, Rommel's constant friend was lost to him, and the British defences opened up with cruel precision on the advancing panzers. Each fresh attack was met with the same screen of bombing and anti-tank fire. The outcome was inevitable. As the day closed, 645 casualties was a mercifully low number for the Germans. But with 52 panzers lost, Rommel knew he had been defeated. Appeals to Hitler met with the usual irrational exaggeration of the situation, leading Rommel to conclude that the Axis troops should leave Africa entirely. Rommel flew to Germany to try and persuade the Führer of the sense of his argument. All he achieved was to be relieved of his command by being ordered on sick leave. He was never to see Africa again. Rommel had shaken the Allied High Command with his skill. 
the Americans used General George S. Patton to stiffen the fighting resolve of the American Second Corps, who had until then suffered from poor leadership. Soon his forces were engaged in battles designed to draw the Germans away from Montgomery's advance westwards along the coast. He was biting on iron, and for three weeks repeated assaults found no way past the German defences. Yet his presence had galvanised the Americans, whereas Rommel's absence was being felt among the Germans. German assaults that Rommel would never have considered led to needless deaths. Montgomery's attack on the Axis-held Marath Line had begun on the 20th of March. Intended as a frontal attack on the coast, initial repulses made him adapt his tactics and turn inland to attack the Axis flanks. Once more, his flexibility was to bring him success. Helped by Indian troops, the famous Gurkhas, the British were slowly but surely pushing back the Axis forces. But the defence was hard to break down. Bombers and artillery were constantly in action, and no assault was certain of success, whatever the advantages. The attack to grind down the Germans continued unabated through into April. Eventually, the relentlessness of the Allied assaults paid dividends. Arnim was told that it would not be possible to hold off the British much longer. The decision to withdraw was made and carried out on the 6th of April. On both fronts, April 7th found Patton and Montgomery without an immediate enemy. On that afternoon, the 8th Army and the American 2nd Corps met up on the coastal plains to the southwest of Port Sfax. The meeting ushered in the last days of the German presence in North Africa. Hitler refused to countenance evacuation. He feared an Allied assault in Italy, where Mussolini was fast losing his grip on power. His fevered commands could only hold up the Allies, not stop them. Axis troops were now retreating onto Tunis and its neighbouring town of Bizerta, strongholds where the last stand was about to take place. They dug in along a front line 130 miles in length and waited for the Allies to come. Montgomery's role was reduced to producing a diversionary attack for the main thrust on Tunis, a move which aggravated him intensely. Despite protests, he had no choice and on the 19th of April opened Operation Vulcan. It quickly disintegrated into a series of infantry and tank battles, a war of attrition. The Germans proved such tenacious defenders from their dugouts in the desert hills that by the 25th, the Allied offensive had been brought to a standstill, although the Axis troops were by now in a desperate plight and were forced to withdraw still further. Supplies to frontline troops had almost dried up, with men subsisting on two slices of bread per day. But with Hitler's orders to fight on, the German forces gave no ground. Losses on all sides were terrible. In capturing the infamous Hill 609, the Americans counted 200 men dead, 1,600 wounded, and 700 missing or captured. The fighting did not lessen in intensity as April passed into May, when Alexander decided on a massive final push to Tunis and Bizerta to prevent a further Axis withdrawal and end the conflict. On the 5th, the air filled with Allied bombers. For 24 hours, they lay a blanket of bombs over the German defenders, the heaviest air raid the desert had seen. It was accompanied by a 600-gun artillery barrage on the road to Tunis before the first British tanks surged out, followed by the infantry. They overwhelmed the German front lines and began to speed towards Tunis, ignoring the small pockets of resistance on their flanks. In the Americans' push to Bizerta, a similar pattern developed. The flood was now unstoppable. The British waves crashed over Tunis at 4 p.m. on May the 7th, the same day the Americans moved into Bizerta, 
The end had arrived so fast that everyone was stunned. Amongst the celebrations of the citizens, snipers and pockets of resistance were a danger to the new occupiers. Von Arnim, meanwhile, had hastily gathered his troops and moved out towards the hills in Cape Bon, northeast of Tunis, pursued by the British, who performed one of the most extraordinary feats of the war. With astounding speed, outnumbered by the enemy, they cut the German troops into sections that could no longer communicate with one another. The entire command structure collapsed. Even as the end of the fighting came, so too did a message from Hitler to fight to the last bullet. On May the 11th, von Arnim surrendered. The Italian commander, General Giovanni Messer, two days later. On that day, the 13th of May, 1943, Alexander told Churchill that the campaign was over. The Allies were masters of the African shores. It had been a titanic struggle. And it was sobering to reflect on what Rommel might have achieved had he possessed even half the troops he desired at El Alamein. Over 18,000 German soldiers were killed in North Africa, with almost 3,500 missing. The Italians lost more than 13,500 men. The British and Commonwealth forces lost 35,500 the French over 16,000, and the Americans 16,500. A grisly tribute to the effectiveness of German troops. Disillusioned with Hitler since El Alamein, Rommel was implicated in an assassination attempt on the Führer. He was ordered to commit suicide or cause the arrest of his family and his own trial. Rommel took leave of his wife and son and poisoned himself. Montgomery, Patton and Eisenhower went on to further glory in Europe. Their desert war had robbed Germany of troops vital for the battle still to come. Without victory in the desert, the course of World War II would have been very different. The conflict in North Africa that will forever be remembered for the greatest duel that ever took place under the desert sun between two giants of military history, Rommel and Montgomery, welded the Allies into a formidable unity. But for the men from Britain, France, America or Germany who fought the gruelling battles, wherever the fighting would take them in the future, their hearts would remain forever with their fallen comrades under the burning sun of the North African desert. <laughs>